So Richard is uh, very well placed to, uh, <laughs> to uh, elaborate on this subject. So the UK has the highest spend of any European country on defense, security and also intelligence, and has a significant surplus in this area versus the EU. We also have a special relationship with the US. We have uh, very strong NATO participation, uh, bilateral relationships with most EU countries, and very strong ties with uh, France and Germany on security and intelligence. So with the exception of Europol and also the Prum Convention, uh, we have everything in place to have very strong security. Now, most of these relationships are independent of uh, uh, the UK's status with the EU. However, in the run-up to the referendum, there was much said about this. And I'll give you a few examples. Michael Fallon said, the UK will be taking a big gamble with its security if it is to leave the European Union. There were former CDSs, heads of intelligence services, that said the same. Uh, former uh, secretaries of state, secretaries of defense in the US, said that the UK leaving the EU would help the West's enemies. So my question to you, Richard, is post-Brexit, will our security be compromised? And if so, how? And what can we do to mitigate any impact? Um, well, thank you. Um, that's not a simple question to answer. Um, and I'm afraid I am doomed to give you uh, what you will interpret as a, as a very depressing story about Brexit and security, because I think through a mixture of accident and um, incompetence, uh, we will, um, in parallel with the Brexit process, significantly continue to weaken our defence and security. Uh, and the reason I say that is, um, normally in a conversation with, with an audience like this, the, the, the focus is on the marginal effects of leaving the institutions of the European Union. So, so uh, the European Union wouldn't receive our money, so it'd have left to spend on its what is effectively a second development program. We would leave the EU military structures, and, and people want to know how might that uh, reduce our security. Or they want to ask, well, if we're good at defence and security, and Johan has described how we have a surplus in these things and we're held to be good at it, how might that be a card that we play in securing better terms in the Brexit negotiations? But underlying those two questions is generally the thought that our defence and security is in a good place, and so these marginal changes are from uh, a reasonable position. And in fact, I think um, because of the... Um, all-consuming focus on Brexit. Um, we are very likely to go through the Brexit process uh, on the assumption that our defence and security is fine, when actually, in many respects, as a result of a journey travel for the last 25 years, it is quite close to institutional failure. Uh, and we will um, not find the political will or bandwidth or resources or societal interest to set about the transformation of defence and security in parallel with Brexit, and we will absolutely miss the opportunity to transform on the back of uh, innovation, and we will watch others in the world who, who don't wish us well developing method and capability in the defence arena that, that can genuinely do us harm, and we will see the sort of innovation that we like to be good at going abroad first, even from our own companies. And none of that is going to be a result of the business of Brexit. It's going to be an effect of the all-consuming nature of Brexit and the flawed assumption that our defence and security in our time is in a reasonable place. Now, I had a conversation with the Austrian Chancellor last week, which was uh, interesting. He thought relations with uh, the UK was very, very important. 
but he was very concerned that um, there was a lack of enthusiasm with the number of EU member states, which um, is contradictory to, I think, what Germany and France and many of the original EU 14 uh, view on this is. And this has to do mainly with the repercussions of Brexit, which for a lot of Eastern European states means less money. Now, if you were the CDS in Germany and you had to give advice to Angela Merkel, flipping sides, what would you advise her to do in, um, in Brexit? Um, well, the first thing I do is I, I would, if I were the CDS of Germany, I, I would, uh, would like a conversation with the Chancellor about what do they think they mean when politicians in France and Germany and elsewhere talk about a European army. Because I think they mean an army which looks like the sorts of forces they saw deployed in Bosnia or Kosovo and maybe even in Afghanistan. So, so light forces, uh, army, heavy, bit of air power, but men in armoured vehicles, men and women actually, in armoured vehicles with helmets and, and rifles, and they talk about battle groups. And there's a, f a huge strategic danger that um, that sense of what a military force is takes root and is built as a separate... European identity duplicating in part what NATO already does and absolutely does not understand that in the time we live in, the capability that you, you need to protect Europe at home and its interests abroad um, through armed force requires a completely different level of joint and combined capability which only NATO has and it's only the US underpinning to NATO that delivers strategic command and control, theater air defense, anti-ballistic missile defense, theater level logistics, joined up um, training, um, and the resilience of having the strategic depth that the, the, that the US provides. Um, and so my first plea to the chancellor would be, if you are conceiving of building a European defense identity, that we must pause and define what that means in the 21st century and not seduce ourselves that we're going to get away with a defence model fit for the minor discretionary interventions of the 1990s. And I imagine that might be quite a difficult and potentially very expensive um, conversation. And the second thing I would say to the Chancellor is we need to recognise how uh, people in the world that uh, we're not on the best of terms with, and, and that might be Russia, but not necessarily so, but we'll say Russia, uh, and possibly in the future um, a, a resurgent, ambitious, wealthy China, who have already developed um, military method and military capability, which means they have an edge over what we thought was our technological advantage. So they uh, can already cause harm in our homelands, whether that's cyber or ballistic missiles, very good article in the Times today from the Pentagon about uh, ballistic missiles, um, or uh, new other forms of advanced conventional capability. So, so they can cause us harm that we cannot deal with any longer, and they have developed uh, protective means, their own air defense, for example, that means we cannot cause harm to them. And you saw a little sign of that just last week when the US Air Force shot down a Syrian jet over Syria, and it caused the Russians to be cross and to start to say that they would look at coalition aircraft as targets. And you immediately saw air forces, including the Royal Air Force, having to adjust how they operate because they know that if those Russian systems are turned on in anger and in earnest and well done, they present a really significant problem. So if the Chancellor could accept that Europe has lost its military edge and created a scope for opportunism in the eyes of, of, of Russia and, and I guess others, then it has to lead to a conversation about how do you exploit the capacity for innovation in technology that exists in Europe to recreate that competitive edge. And that's about building military forces that seize on the opportunity of the fourth industrial revolution to restore a competitive edge. And by the way, in doing that, become more influential and more prosperous. 
and I would hope that would appeal to the Chancellor's and Germany's engineering instincts. And I think that would have made for quite a full discussion. I can see that being a very interesting uh, conversation. Now, should we perhaps have a special relationship with the EU after this, along the lines of, of uh, what we have with the US? Um, I think in the, in the realm of security, of course we have to have a, a special relationship because um, we may change some institutional arrangements in Brexit, but we'll not change our geography and will not change our shared interests in dealing with the perils of terrorism uh, and indeed um, more uh, state-related threats that may or may not present themselves um, in, in the future. Uh, it, for me, it would be madness if we ended up in a world where the UK existed in its own defence and security space somehow isolated and kept out of the room from those discussions that might now occur, whether it's about terrorism or uh, or, or uh, other aspects of the use or the threat of the use of force. Uh, if that occurs, it will be as a result either of sharing competence in the negotiations or uh, as a result of the generation of profound ill feeling, but it will not be in the interests of any of the parties in, in Europe. So yes, there must be, in defence and security, a special relationship. Uh, I, I think we bring something special to the party in any case, even though on a very limited scale uh, these days. And we must make sure that relationship is about um, employing the European Union's soft power, which is prodigious, but in the revitalization and transformation of NATO and its remobilization to a degree so it can cope with the contemporary range of threats, which at the minute, frankly, it can't because it's mostly asleep. Well, you did mention not being left out of the room, but um, in her Lancaster House speech, uh, Theresa May did remind the EU in a friendly manner, I might add, about our surplus in this area and that we would continue to be enthusiastic as long as we were friends. Uh, of course, as you've highlighted, that the overriding interests here are national security and security of all citizens. Uh, so, this is obviously a card because we have a surplus, but could this not be used in a positive manner, i.e. doing more? Strengthening bilateral relationships on intelligence sharing, uh, bigger commitment to NATO. How do you see that? Um, well, uh, <laughs> I, I think for uh, the generation of political leadership across Europe right now, uh, there is this presumption that defence and security is in a reasonable place. I mean, in the last election campaign, in a YouGov poll, defence rated below don't know as an election uh, uh, issue. So there is a uh, profound reluctance to have a debate in many European countries, including, including the United Kingdom, um, about the true effects of the um, iterative reductions in our investment in defence, particularly uh, military capabilities since the end of the, of the Cold War. So we appear to be locked in a world of profound denial about the true state of our armed forces as clearly smaller, clearly less well equipped, clearly hollowed out in terms of sustainability and resilience, clearly demobilised, no plans, no mobilisation um, plans. Um, and although we can explain that for very good reasons, we understand why we are where we are, um, denying that that is the case and relying on, on a combination of hope and prayer, prayer that we're not somehow uh, found out by that, I think is not a good place to start. So in the discussion about the surplus in defence, we would need to recognise that we have huge holes in, uh, in our defence fabric that that surplus is, um, is not going to tackle. And I think all the signs are we're about to see that made worse as um, uh, the Strategic Defence and Security Review of 2015, which, for which the numbers ne never, never added up. I mean, if you have £26 billion worth of up arrows, but you only provide, uh, sorry, £24 billion of up arrows, you only provide £6 billion worth of more money, and even that is later, you are going to end up in the situation which we all know defence is facing now, where uh, it is going to have to reduce the scope of STSR 15, which, in, which had many uh, good features, in order to 
make it, the, the remnant uh, 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 affordable. So it seems to me not particularly plausible that we can talk about playing our defence and security surplus when actually we are about to uh, deplete what we do on the back of the holes we've created for 25 years. Um, and we're going to continue to deny that our armed forces uh, are living life now inches from institutional failure every day. So with that in mind, are we relevant enough post-Brexit? What do we need to do to reinvent ourselves? And particularly, mm -hmm. if you look at the special relationship we have with the US, where we have a president that is, seems to be less interested in what the intelligence agencies mm -hmm. have to say, and which makes that relationship, our special relationship, diminished in the sense that it's perhaps not as relevant anymore. Well, I think the starting point for that is, is to recognize that the United Kingdom uh, and our European partners are completely bought into collective security. We, we uh, have been in that situation since the end of the Second World War, uh, and we rely f profoundly and fundamentally on the generosity of the US taxpayer uh, for our security, and it would be a pity, given the scale of sums involved, if that were, if that were, were to diminish. So a relationship with the United States about the security of, of the United Kingdom and Europe remains fundamental to all outcomes. And we absolutely should do all that we can, and that means by contributing sensibly and, and uh, holding other nations' feet to the fire on their contributions, all that we can to uh, ameliorate the effects of a United States that is turning inwards and turning to the Pacific. It's, that's clearly not uh, in, in um, Europe's interest. Secondly, and I've already made this point, I, I think we will unlock the special relationship more uh, if we are honest with ourselves about the state of European defence and recognise that um, a defence model that may have worked perfectly well for 25 years since the end of the Cold War seems to me, and I think others, unlikely to prosper in the world as it's now turning out, whether that's a more assertive Russia, the difficulties in the Gulf, turmoil in Africa, different environment in Asia. We now live in a different world, which potentially, and only potentially, could bring more harm to ourselves and our, uh, and our interests. So if we could have that debate, and then with the United States, and, and I subscribe to the philosophy behind what the US would call the third offset approach of exploiting innovation and technology to reset um, a, a military edge, you know, we should engage with that. Um, because we do have this profound capacity for innovation in this country and if we can harness it to um, defence needs, principally by seeing what's happening in the commercial sector, and the panel before us made this point, and applying it in the military sector, uh, I think that will improve our security at an affordable price, influence our allies and deter our enemies. But that needs a much richer conversation with our European partners and principally with the United States, because they're already doing this. And more investment too. And it will cost a bit of money. Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Richard. Um, there are some questions from um, uh, various people. So I'll um, start with a question from Daniel Mahoney from the CPS. In light of Donald Trump's comments on NATO spending, have European nations been piggybacking on, America, on the American military for too long? Well, um, the answer is, is, is yes, but for some of the reasons I think I've already described, it's, it's a slightly more complicated answer. So uh, since the end of the Cold War in 1990, very few people in Europe have felt any existential threat. And um, in the United Kingdom, and I think in many of our European partners, um, we now have to confront the triple peril, which is the explosion of our public sector in the 1990s, uh, the difficulty in paying for that explosion following the 2008 uh, financial crisis um, and, and the subsequent battle against austerity, which I gather we've now declared unsuccessful but over. And, and thirdly, the fatigue that set in as a result of the interventions in Iraq and Afghanistan about how we would use force uh, in a discretionary way, let's be honest, uh, uh, in our world. So in that environment, you can see why Europe has spent less 
um, comforted by the fact that the United States spends 10 times as, as much. And the United States is pointing out that it cannot make the case to its own people to sustain that level of investment if many taxpayers in the US think we are freeloading on, on their work. And they're saying that quite loudly and clearly. But the debate is more complicated because um, of the way the world is turning out. And if, if we look over the fence at, um, at uh, a number of conflicts in the world, we should recognize that um, we, we, we need to raise our game, restore to a degree our defense capability, and that's going to cost money that we might prefer to spend on other things, but we, we may or may not uh, have a choice to do this, and we should do it in an innovative way. So uh, I think we are absolutely at the end of hoping the US taxpayer will pay for the protection of Europe in a much harder world. You previously said President Trump could provoke a war. Has your opinion changed six months after his uh, presidency? Um, well, I think it's not proven. Um, but I think uh, you know, the capacity to turn a superpower on a sixpence through a single tweet uh, isn't a particularly strategic approach to uh, a difficult world. Um, I set great store by the fact that as time passes, uh, Mr. Trump's administration is to a degree learning by doing. Uh, and I set, set great store by the fact that um, people I count as friends like um, Jim Mattis and John Kelly are uh, in the inner circles of that administration have been given, I think, greater independence and more latitude and will provide wise operational counsel. That they might argue they're not you know, natural policy makers, but they'll provide uh, wise counsel council. But I do think we have to accept um, that in a world where harm can be in inflicted at click speed uh, or, or as a result of the use of, of for example, a conventional ballistic missile which will arrive um, uh, at very short notice, there is a danger uh, that we could end up in conflict for very poor reasons as a result of poorly controlled escalation and profound miscalculation as the red mist descends. Um, I, I don't think it can be proven yet that we are immune to that danger. Now, uh, the last question I have here is from Mohammed via Twitter. How realistic is the desire for the rules-based international order when the US behaves as if rules only apply to other countries? Well, I think, well, a number of comments. The first thing, I, I think we live in the Asian century, and I think we're beginning to see uh, the first substantive clashes between American exceptionalism, which we're rather used to, and, and indeed have subscribed to and followed, and the regeneration of Chinese exceptionalism, which is saying uh, that there's a, there are new powers in our world. It's a multipolar world now. Uh, China will become the world's most powerful e economy, and it has a different view of the rules-based international order. Uh, I think we are still operating as a society and perhaps also in our politics in a frame of mind that assumes post the end of the Cold War, somehow the end of history, Europe immune to war, uh, which I think is, is, is uh, very difficult to prove, um, but where this idea of a Western liberal democratic conception of the rules-based international order is accepted by everybody globally as the answer and it's only a question of time because we're clearly seeing um, those rules challenged, East and South China Sea uh, would be an, an example, and where people are producing other prescriptions, whether that's China or ISIS uh, or, uh, or, or even in Latin America the way cartels operate as pseudo-states. So I think we should recognize that when we say rules-based international order, we mean the thing that's worked quite well for 25 years, and we need to recognize it is being challenged uh, and it's, it's not guaranteed to survive. And in those settings, we're moving away from a time where we went to war as a matter of discretion, and we're moving into a time where we may have to go to war as a matter of necessity as these things become quite fundamental clashes. And that requires the transformation and revitalization, revitalization of our national defense in preparation for this and our collective defense. And I don't think that debate has even started. Richard, thank you very much. Thank you.